of last previous year. And um, it's um, now um, my pleasure to introduce you Alba for the ones that uh, don't know it. So Alba um, has a mission uh, to uh, increase uh, diversity, equity and inclusion in uh, um, neuroscience. And um, it has been empower empowering brain scientists who uh, came from underrepresented groups, uh, providing better visibility and sharing data and best practices um, among uh, neuroscientists. Um, it uh, has essentially four uh, main blocks. Uh, in the first block, it uh, uh, aims at um, raise awareness and advocacy. It also uh, has a data and resources uh, group uh, who uh, create databases and uh, try to um, evidence guidelines and strategies to improve uh, inclusion. Uh, it aims at increased visibility and recognition, recognition of underrepresented neuroscientists, as I mentioned before. And it also has um, a great um, force uh, in networking and mentoring um, among neuroscientists. Um, Alva has a declaration that I invite you to uh, see in the website and to sign it if you um, agree with um, the principles and, and um, the issues that uh, it, it um, encourage uh, among neuroscientist communi communities. And um, it has, of course, um, some um, institutions that give uh, some support, uh, mainly FANS, IBRO, SFN, uh, the Brain Prize of Lundbeck Foundation, Elsevier, uh, etc. Um, last year, in the summer, we began um, this Disability and Accessibility Working Group uh, that uh, aims at increased visibility of neuroscientists with disabilities. Um, so it, it, uh, want, we want to raise awareness uh, around disabilities in uh, their workplace and foster back, best practices and uh, inclusion uh, and access to equal uh, accommodation conditions. Um, so we started uh, in December, as I, I mentioned before, this webinar series that aims at bring down ableism um, of disabilities. And uh, we uh, will give a platform with uh, for uh, different neuroscientists with different backgrounds and different perspectives every uh, session. So this... Okay, so this time it is my pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, Philip uh, Hayden, Professor Philip Hayden that will give the webinar, I Can and I Will, My Journey with Ep Epilepsy and Neuroscience. And now my colleague, Ryanan, will introduce uh, Professor uh, Philip Hayden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina, and welcome to everyone today to our second seminar. And today we're gonna to be joined by Professor Philip Hayden. He works at the Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston in the USA. And today he'll be talking to us both about his research, but more importantly about his experience in the research field with a disability. Philip runs an active laboratory researching a multitude of neurological disorders, including epilepsy. And he is also president of the charity Sale for Epilepsy. His mission is to inspire people with epilepsy, to raise funds, to support research for a cure, and to promote awareness of epilepsy and educate the public. And we're absolutely thrilled to have Philip here today. So Phil, over to you. And if anyone has questions, feel free to just um, ask during the presentation or afterwards by writing into the chat box and we will get to the questions at the end of the webinar. Right, thank you very much. And over to you then, Phil. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ree. Just one second. Are you, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, okay. Well, th thanks, Ria. Thank, all, thank you to all of you for the invitation to um, present today about this journey that I've had and also for what you're doing. I think it's very important to discuss disabilities. And so many people who have disabilities just don't talk about it. So having people willing to speak, I think, is extremely important because we can take the stigma away from many disorders and allow people to actually be themselves. 
So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a journey uh, from when I was 15 years of age, which of course oh, it was only about a decade ago. Um, and uh, it's at this point, I had a head injury, which led me to have um, epilepsy. I'll talk a little bit about the challenges in high school, getting, making it through university just, and then ultimately having a, a successful career. I'll give you a little bit about sort of my research area, but then I'll tell you about sale for epilepsy and what we're trying to do in this with people around the globe uh, to reduce stigma and inspire people to live fuller lives. But first we're gonna have a quiz, which is difficult to do online. And um, so I'll just go as if you're answering. Uh, how many people will develop epilepsy in their lifetime? So there's a range of answers that people will give from one in 10,000 down to one in 10. And um, the surprising answer is one in 26 people will develop epilepsy. Um, but even more staggering, one in 10 people will have at least one seizure in their lifetime. And I'll talk about what is epilepsy and the types of seizures in a little while. But first, let's talk about me. This was uh, July 6th, 1973. I was, it was the last day of school before the summer holidays. And I was on my bike riding home. And we were actually going on vacation the next morning. Uh, I've learned a lot of this recently as I've been doing the South Epilepsy journey, as my brother has been speaking to me in this there's like a couple of years which I have no memory of after this head injury. So in the uh, the top here, you see these are the medical records I got from Oxford Radcliffe Infirmary, which is now part of Oxford University. And I was riding my bike, someone threw a house brick and I caught it in my forehead and I ended up with a depressed compound fracture of the skull. It, uh, I had a two inch diameter piece of skull removed. I was without skull there for a year until a metal plate was put in. I'm fortunate after about five or six years, I became medically controlled. I started having uh, generalized seizures uh, within an hour of the head injury. A generalized seizure is when you, uh, it's essentially across the whole brain, you lose consciousness and you will have muscle movements. My medical records, uh, it's really been quite fun going back and reading some of these med medical records. And uh, there's an interesting thing about in the prognosis from the uh, neurosurgeon in Oxford who wrote to my um, primary care physician in my hometown, Swindon. And the uh, thing, he talks about the epilepsy attacks and says, because of the continued um, medications, this this may impact job opportunities in the future, although they certainly hope it, it would not. And the medications, it was a real struggle. So in 1912, the first anticonvulsant was developed and it's called phenobarbitone. And if any of you know about phenobarbitone, it's a barbiturate, it's a depressant, and one gets very drowsy. So I used to fall asleep in high school and it was an incredible challenge to listen to the teachers. I was also a teenager, um, so, uh, say no more, but with the medications, it was really hard to, to make it. Now, one of, I would say my characteristics is I will not give up. And in England, what we would do in the summer, we wanted to play cricket, but I had a two inch diameter piece of skull missing. And, it's, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. My choice was to sit on the couch and do nothing or get out there. So my parents were very supportive. And at that time in cricket, you didn't use a helmet. Um, we, were, we were more match, <coughs> uh, inappropriately so. But my parents got me an ice hockey helmet. I wore a helmet and we changed the, the rules of the game so that my mates who I played with there were no fastballs. And this meant I played by the same rules as my mates. And I was able to get out and be in the be in the field playing cricket every day of the summer once I had to convalesce from the initial injury. And this is a message that I'd like to give everybody that we all have some challenges in our life, whether it's epilepsy, mental health issues, is to find a way to make it happen. 
may not be able to make everything happen, but challenge yourself to do it. And the reason I was able to do this um, was really my parents. So here, this is this is Phil when he had hair uh, with my mum and my dad, and this is in Leeds where I got my um, bachelor's and PhD. And this is my grandma Lil. She uh, she was an incredible force. She had uh, ulcerated lower lower legs, and she was constantly having treatment, and. She cut little sentences out of self-help books and you'd see them stuck on the refrigerator. And the one that resonates in our family is I can and I will. And this is how she lived her life. She didn't let anything get in her way. So for example, the doctor said to her, well, you should stop riding your bike. She rode her bike till she was about 84, every day. And he said, you should stop riding your bike. You know, we may have to amputate your legs. She got on her bike and she rode it. She said, darn it, I might as well use them while I've got them. Uh, so this, she's a very lovely lady with this strong attitude. And to this day, my brothers and my uncle, we have a WhatsApp group message and something's happening you know, in the family. You'll undoubtedly find that somebody just sends the message, I can and I will. And this is something that really is constantly in my life. And on my sailboats, I have, I can and I will, because when I'm sailing offshore, there is going to be a moment of significant challenge. So um, when I was in high school, you know, I had, you know, I was still having seizures. Um, I failed half of my O-level examinations. My A-levels were, uh, they were a challenge. My first day when I got to university, um, I had a I had a tonic clonic seizure amongst all of my new friends uh, at university. But one thing I found was by um, being open. Clearly, I was open about it because I had a seizure. Uh, people were incredibly uh, supportive, and this was something that I've been surprised about. When people know the support they give is incredible. So Charlie, my roommate. He came up to the next morning, put his arm around me, and he said, tell me about epilepsy and what can I do to help you? So I uh, managed to make it through university, uh, did a postdoc in the United States, and then I managed to have a career, and now I'm chair of neuroscience at Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm going to show three or four slides just about the type of research we've been doing and uh, that's on ongoing. And then we'll move into another topic. So I really have uh, made a name for myself in studying the glial cells, in particular the astrocytes. And this is a drawing that was made post-mortem from a human brain by Santiago Romani Cajal. And it shows here the a neuron in the center. You can see a blood vessel and then um, I'm sorry, the, the neurons are here. This is the astrocyte. The astrocyte contacts the blood vessel and contacts the neuron. And at this time, just based on the anatomy, he made some predictions. So he proposed, proposed the astrocytic processes or electrical insulators that when extended between neurons acts as circuit breakers to facilitate sleep, but when retracted, allows circuits to communicate, promoting wakefulness. This was incredible insight because this happens. And this is one of the areas that we've been studying is what the astrocytes do. And a key thing is they control sleep. The nice thing, of course, in the late 1800s, you didn't need to actually have data to make conclusions, uh, but now we're a little more constrained. Now the neurosciences have been, everything in science is about the technique you should have. Um, we're not question limited, but we're technique limited. And if you think back to the history, and originally there was anatomy, which Cajal was using. And a key thing there was the development of the silver stain. Then in the early 1900s, it was possible to make electrical recordings and stimulate. And as a consequence, we studied neurons because they were electrically excitable. But astrocytes are not electrically excitable. And it wasn't until the uh, sort of 80s, 90s, that we actually saw they are excitable, but with a different signal. And this is because Roger Chen developed 
chemically synthesized calcium indicators. And for me, the paper that turned me on to glial cells was this paper from Stephen Smith's lab. And I remember the Science Magazine arriving with this paper in it and the cover picture. And it was the day our first confocal microscope was being um, installed. And in this paper, what they show is if you add glutamate, you get calcium oscillations in astrocytes. But what does the calcium do? So what we did, this was in cell culture, we found that calcium causes transmitters to be released from astrocytes. And this was, um, remember the reviews that came uh, from Nature, and one of the reviewers who I now know who it was, made the comment, this is really important, you better be right. And then followed with pages and pages of uh, suggestions which made the, the paper better. But in uh, if we look in this upper right, we're measuring superfusate around astrocytes and we use a stimulus bradykinin that raises calcium and you can see glutamates released. As a consequence, our work and many others, we went on to define the synapse as a tripartite synapse uh, to recognize the important role of astrocytes shown in green here. So there's the pre and post synaptic terminal, the astrocyte, it has, it has important roles in buffering potassium, uptake of transmitter, but these cells express a plethora of receptors, which cause calcium mobilization, uh, cyclic AMP changes, so on and so forth. But the challenge has always been, how do we actually figure out what they do? And what we found is another compound they release is actually ATP that gives rise to adenosine. And this needed um, cell-specific molecular genetics, and we collaborated with Ken McCarthy, and we were able to express the snare domain of a synaptic protein. The, that snare protein actually is expressed in astrocytes too. And without going through all the data, we know there's a tonic adenosine tone in the extracellular space in cortex and hippocampus. That tone comes from the astrocytic source of adenosine. And if any of you got up this morning and had a cup of coffee, the reason you're having the coffee is caffeine is an antagonist of the adenosine receptor. And it's the astrocytes providing that adenosine that are still making you sleepy. So tomorrow when you have a coffee, you're blocking your astrocytic signals. So we've come through and we've done a lot of studies on sleep, uh, learning and memory, and uh, I end up teasing apart when does the astrocyte versus the neuron have its role. So um, in addition, in the lab, we have translational programs in epilepsy, in Alzheimer's disease, and we've even uh, been able to have spin-off companies and set off uh, clinical trials based on some of those observations. But rather than go down that path, I'd like to talk about epilepsy. What is it? And so few people actually know. Epilepsy is just, auto, you know, different electrical activity. Uh, it's an enhancement in activity that causes what we term a seizure. One in 10 people have a seizure in their lifetime. But if you have two or more seizures, you are now termed to have epilepsy. There are many types of epilepsy, many causes, and not all ep forms of epilepsy are medically controlled. A third of people with epilepsy are not responsive to a medical intervention. For um, thinking of um, the abnormal activity, here's a, an EEG recorded from somebody, and then these large spikes of activity. This is when a seizure is occurring. And you can see in the picture, these are electrodes placed over the head. And you can see that this electrical activity is generalized across the brain. This person will likely have lost consciousness and have the, I call it the Hollywood seizure, where people are, you have these tonic clonic movements during, uh, during the seizure. Epilepsy can come from many reasons. Head injury, that was my cause. Uh, stroke, uh, there are specific uh, mutations in genes, for example, ion channels that lead to increased electrical activity, seizures, and epilepsies. Many times, the first time you know that you have uh, a brain tumor is you have a seizure. You then have a brain scan, and that seizure it, it was caused by the tumor. And then also another reason is uh, it, brain infections can lead to this activity and seizures. Whoops, there we go. But 
don't think about epilepsy only being a Hollywood seizure, but rather if you look at the electrical activity of a brain and we go from a healthy, say to generalized seizure, in a generalized seizure, you have electrical activity elevated throughout the brain, but you can have a very focal change in electrical activity. And that does may not cause you to lose consciousness. You may not have movements, but there could be muscle tightening, unusual head movements, blank stares. There's something called absence epilepsy, where, and I've had absence epilepsy, and I'm just essentially paused for a moment. And then after a few seconds, I regain uh, sort of knowledge of what's occurring, but I don't lose my consciousness. Uh, you can get tingling, numbness, hallucinations. You can smell things. So, And probably what this is, is they're having a, a seizure in different parts of the brain that's just very localized and then causing changes in perception and action. And to treat epilepsy, there's anti-epileptic drugs. There can be brain stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, surgery. And the first treatment ever for epilepsy was a diet called the ketogenic diet. And there is now a lot, uh, this is hundreds of uh, years ago, this was first developed. It's incredibly effective in children. They can stop their seizures, but if they have a candy bar or sweets, um, the, uh, it will immediately lead to a seizure because of the increase in glucose in the blood. In 2011, um, I nearly died. I had an allergic reaction to a medication I was taking, a severe allergic reaction. It causes something called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which has about a 50% fatality rate. And I was in hospital for a week to 10 days and then convalescing for a few months. And in this period of convalescence, I started thinking, you know, I've, I've managed to push and have a successful career. Can I give back and do something? So I conceptualized cell for epilepsy. And then over a few years, I worked with a good friend of mine who's a sailor and uh, we put together cell for epilepsy. And our goal is let's inspire people with epilepsy to do more. Let's not sit on the couch, frightened to do anything. We raise funds for research and we promote awareness of epilepsy and educate the public. I wanna talk about some of the programs we have in place. We have what's called the One More Step program. And the idea of the One More Step Child program is we challenge people to take one more step to live a fuller life with safety guardrails in place. If you think of cricket, my safety guardrail was I had a helmet and we didn't have fastballs. Um, we now have one more step information in five, I think it's five languages. And we have people who signed up for the One More Step Challenge in 18 countries. And when they sign up, they become a virtual shipmate. Uh, so we then put the name on the boat and we sail for them. Abigail, who lives uh, about 100 miles from Boston, uh, she has a mutation in the SEN8A gene, uh, which leads to a severe, severe form of epilepsy. And her one more step is she's going to try to take a step on her own. And I find these people just incredibly brave and strong. And we're in connection with them. We communicate and they periodically update us on their one more step. Here are their names. This is early in the program where we had, uh, we had a, uh, I don't know, maybe 60 names on the, there's also names on the other side of the boat. They're virtual shipmates. And then I communicate with them when we're sailing offshore. So in the past year, um, oh, my one more step is to sail the oceans of the world with safety guardrails in place. So we have a lot of safety mechanisms so that I can sail safely. Uh, and last summer, um, we sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. We started in Fort Lauderdale, came over to the Azores, and then onto Porto, and then Lisbon. We saved, sailed over 5,000 miles. We had uh, events in the US, Portugal, Morocco, and we had virtual events. And we had events while we were on the boat using a high-speed satellite system. I never get tired of this video. Uh, this is somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. 
we were we saw so many dolphins it's just incredible sunsets were wonderful but not everything was wonderful um we had um we, we went through a gale and we had to essentially park the boat uh, and the way we parked the boat is you Normally you have two sails working together to move the boat. We move the sails so there, one's essentially trying to take you left, the other's trying to take you right, in which case you sit in, in, you sit in position. This is at the end of the gale when things have calmed down significantly. We just parked it and actually took a nap. Uh, I know it's hard to imagine you could take a nap, but it worked nicely. We made it to Horta. Um, in the Azores and for just what happens here is people will make paintings on the dock when they arrive there because it's such a huge feat to get to Horta. Whilst we were sailing, um, virtual shipmates, I do a video call to them and we have a conversation like Conlon, I talked to him about uh, the boat. I took him around the boat, showed him various features of it. Um, and Conlon is taking ski lessons, but he's wearing his helmet. And he's, his thing is he wants to now take on exercises. We also do features about people who give us permission. And let me play you a video. Today's virtual shipmate feature is Blur Sanders, who's from Middlesex, United Kingdom. Blur, I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in England in a town called Swindon which is not too far from where you live. And I'll actually be visiting uh, this summer. Uh, Blue is six years old and has epilepsy as well as hydrocephalus and some other um, disorders. But Blue is an incredible individual. Blue is uh, going swimming every week. That's Blue's one more step challenge. And I'm really excited by your challenge, Blue. It can be a little daunting to take on new feats uh, but I love that you're not letting your epilepsy get in the way. Uh, this is something we all have to do. And I really want to hear more about this. Are you learning to swim or do you already know how to swim? Are you managing to swim once a week? I'd love to hear. And maybe you can either email to me or do a Facebook message. Blue's parents say that Blue is their inspiration. And I can understand why. They must be so proud. Blow a little bit of information about where we are. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We're 1,400 nautical miles from Florida, 1,200 nautical miles from the Azores. We are heading to Europe. And at the moment, the depth of the water is 18,000 feet. We know how to swim. The, um, oops. So we make these videos whilst we're sailing and we transmit them back to land and we have a shore uh, person who helps put the, do the editing and put it together and then we're transmitting as we're going across uh, the oceans. We get, uh, whilst we were on the ocean, we also did a live video feed into a neurolog neurology conference in Portugal. Uh, we talked about what we're doing and the neurologists and neurosurgeons asked us questions as we're sailing. We then uh, here in Horta, we had events and with the local Brodery Club, a sailing club, and this is at Pete's Cafe. And people start opening up. And when you say I have epilepsy and talk about it, people start responding. This gentleman is the vice president of the Rotor Club. He started talking to me about his son and his epilepsy. This chap, he talked about his problems with epilepsy and the message whether it's epilepsy or any other disability, I can and I will. You have, you're not necessarily going to be able to achieve everything, but you have to strive to achieve. When we do events, this, this young girl, lady has uh, epilepsy. We show some simple knots that are used in, um, in sailing. And we were, we were out sailing in Aveiro, Portugal. This is just south of Porto. And then she ultimately took the helm and steered the boat. And then this lad in Almada, this is across the river from Lisboa. Uh, he has some developmental disorders and epilepsy. 
And for 20 minutes, he was trying to tie a knot. And eventually he did it. And his jubilation and his dad's jubilation was just something else. Uh, we had a event, a community events with people with epilepsy and they, they met for the first time and then they ended up making their own WhatsApp messaging group and they've now made their connections together. Uh, and this is Alexander uh, who set up the neurology conference. And this is one of his patients who he performed neurosurgery on. And he challenged her, you might see he's got a one more step card in his uh, hand. He challenged her to take the one more step. And after about 20 minutes, she decided what it's gonna be. And it, she's gonna learn to ride a horse and she's gonna get into the Olympics. And I love that she's setting a high bar that she's gonna push and she is not letting the disability get in the way. Will she achieve her goal? Um, I don't know. But if you don't set the bar high, you won't exceed it. We also do fla flags are important in sailing. Uh, we use them to send signals. And every place we stop, we have uh, children. Uh, we, sorry, in the top left here, we have codes in flag signals. But then we have the kids make their own flags, which they keep. We take pictures and then we make a flag from the kids' pictures. And you, you'll see we then fly the flags from the boat whilst we're in ports in recognition of their bravery. We, were, we went to Morocco, and this is a life-changing experience for me, really seeing how different cultures uh, handle uh, disabilities. And this is a center that's been set up. Uh, so in the top left, this lady in, in the middle here with a gray sweater and white shirt, she set this center up. And it's like a day center where families come with their children. Uh, they'll do um, activities to try and enhance, you know, their brain development. Um, they have, they can have physicians come in and help them. Uh, but it also is a community where parents uh, are able to get, to get together. And this lady here, Hasna, she was my translator. And so we were speaking in English, Arabic, um, oh, the number of languages you know is impressive. And in the top right here, you see there are some mothers who are speaking to me, and they're, you know, they're asking questions that such as, you know, my daughter's been on medicine for two two months and hasn't had a seizure. Is she cured? Can I take her off the medicine? Uh, the amount of information they get is so small. It's it's such a it's so challenging. And then they showed us their prescriptions. And they have a limited number of anticonvulsants that they use or are available, shall I say. But on the prescriptions, they had vitamins. And that's because many of the children are so malnourished because people are so poor. They can't afford to pay for their prescriptions. So what they've the, some of the wealthier people have done is put a grants program into a pharmacy, and then a family that's eligible is able to get three months worth of prescription free of charge. And then they hope that at the end of that three months, there'll be another prescription available for them. But as you can imagine, anticonvulsants, if you withdraw them, you just start having seizures again. And if you take away the medicine, you start having seizures, if you put back the medicine, it's not necessarily going to be effective again. Now, have um, in the lower right hand corner are some of the local herbal rem remedies, and the that are, the local witchcraft and demons is a major issue. Um, we met a doctor, uh, Doctor Najib Kasini, and he works with the epilepsy community, and he did a uh, study of hundred people to get an understanding of their perspectives. 41% um, were illiterate, three quarters were of low income. Half of them thought that epilepsy was linked to witchcraft or demonic possession. Yeah, this is, it's prevalent. And 75% had at least had one consultation with a traditional healer. And only 5% knew first aid basics to apply in case of a seizure. It's staggering, it's really impacted me. And now myself and the team at Sarah for Epilepsy, we are now working with another foundation 
called the Roe Foundation, Rest of the World, Roe. And they work with pharmacists to get medications that can be given to countries that uh, are lower income. So we're making the connections between the doctors and the Roe Foundation. We also went into hospitals. I did a true science uh, presentation at the Molecular Medicine Institute in Lisbon, but an interesting um, hospital visit with this neurologist on the left. At the end, she said, I've been treating my patients incorrectly. I tell them what they can't do. I should be telling them what they can do with safety guardrails in place. Uh, and now just sort of to finalize, we've been here is in Agadir in Morocco. We went into a high school and we, this was education. We challenged the students to teach other people about epilepsy. So we gave an education presentation. There were two classes. One class was in for the beginning and then the second came in for the second half. And we challenged the first group of students to teach the second group of students. And then at the end, we said, go and amplify the message. So we left them posters, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner here. We have them in Arabic, French, English. Uh, they distributed them into pharmacies. They went into an elementary school. And these 70 students reported back to us on Zoom six weeks later that they had personally connected with three and a half thousand people, educating them about epilepsy and epilepsy first aid. And that doesn't include all the social media outreach that they made. So before I finish, I would be remiss if I didn't educate you about seizure first aid. Uh, even families that have somebody with epilepsy don't necessarily know it. Uh, a few simple things. So if I was to fall over and have a generalized seizure, don't restrain the person. Move things away. You don't want secondary injuries. If there's a table or a chair, move it away. The person will have the seizure and it's likely to finish after 30 seconds to a minute. When they regain consciousness, you know, stay with the person, move them on their side, reassure them. I can tell you, when you come around from a seizure, you have no idea what's going on. It's totally confusing. Uh, but reassure them that they're okay, and they'll gradually understand what's happened. Time the seizure, and if it's less than five minutes, it's, it's, it's fine. If it's more than five minutes, call for uh, medical care. If it's less than five minutes, when the person regains consciousness and um, is back lucid again, find out if they have had a seizure before. And if they haven't had a seizure before, they should seek medical attention. Never put anything in a person's mouth with, who's having a seizure. Uh, some people think that you're going to swallow your tongue in a seizure. It is physically impossible. At lunch, I had a seizure, a Sunday lunch with my family. And I was just starting to have the seizure. And my mom put her finger in my mouth to take the food out. She ended up in hospital because of the bite that I put on her finger. I didn't end up in hospital. So move things away, reassure the person, time the seizure. Don't put anything in the mouth. Don't restrain. One in 26 people have a seizure in their lifetime. And there are a lot of well-known people with epilepsy. Prince, uh, when he was a child, had a you know, significant number of seizures. Elton John's had epilepsy. Uh, Vincent van Gogh, and there's a long list of people who we all know. In 2023, at South Epilepsy, we're doing our events, our uh, offshore sailing, and to recognize one in 26, we're gonna sail 2,600 nautical mile in 26 independent legs. We're having events on the West Coast and sign up on social media, you know, at the hashtag sail for epilepsy. We'll have an offshore event starting June 2nd, where I'll be sailing to Bermuda and back. And with that, um, I'll stop sharing and we can have questions. Thank you, Phil. That was really, really interesting. It's amazing to see all the work you're doing and where you've been all around the world so far. So yeah, really, really inspiring. So um, as we said, if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to write them into the chat. Or if you would like to speak to Phil personally, you can also turn your camera on and ask a question. Um, 
So at the moment, we don't have any questions in, but I know sometimes it can take a while because of typing, etc. So perhaps I will start off with the first question. And I was just wondering, so when you were doing your lab work, did you need any special accommodations um, for, for you to be able to work um, like effectively? And if so, how easy was it for you to get these? Did you meet with any resistance perhaps from health, yeah. um, human resources, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually at least something I meant to talk about, but forgot. That's it. why the questions are here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I was told very early on not to say anything about having epilepsy because I'd never get a job. Uh, and so I didn't discuss it publicly. And so I didn't ask for any assistance at work. Uh, if I were able to have my life again, and I, you know, I was a few years younger, there were certain things I would do uh, differently. Like we're, there's something called a seizure action plan. I got a piece of paper that says, this is the type of seizure I have. These are the medications. If I have a seizure, this is what you do. And here are my physicians so you can contact them. Uh, I would have that in place at the uh, place of employment. I think that's extremely important that people do that. But that means you have to open up. And a lot of people are really scared to open up um, because of the stigma. You know, there's a, been a lot on videos and movies about where, you know, seizures are not portrayed in a pot, in a good way. It's just another issue with the brain. You know, it could be I got a kidney disorder or a liver or I got a brain disorder that causes anxiety or depression or it's epilepsy. It's just a circuit's not working properly. But because we don't understand fully this, it's it's scary and, and people don't like it. So in terms of disclosing, you know, epilepsy, at least in the U.S., is uh, is officially a, a disability. And so if you disclose and you need assistance, you have to have the place of employment has to provide it. That being said, I think it's important not to use a disability as a crutch. And there, here where I'm saying about I can and I will is I have to have the internal power and force that I'm going to make it happen. I shouldn't be given special accommodations in terms of, oh, it's easier for me to get a job because I have a disability. Absolutely not. I have to be the one who pushes. I Remember, I can and I will. I'm going to make it happen. But then it's if there are, um, you know, with the last speaker with a wheelchair and his microscope, you know, they had to make accommodations so he could have the microscope accessible with his wheelchair. Ah, that's perfect. That's absolutely how, how, how things should be. But I think he and I both agree. I can and I will. You have to have the power to support, push yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, you have to advocate for yourself because ultimately mm -hmm. someone's probably not going to do it for you. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually, yeah, and it's right to advocate for yourself because it's empowering yourself as well. So I completely yeah. agree with what you're saying. And I understand it is sometimes hard as well. Like you say, when it's a disorder that's to do with the brain, for some reason, it's yeah. much, there's much more stigma attached to it than there is yes. if it was any other part of the body. <laughs> this whole mystery, right? This, yeah, the mystery of the brain. And certainly, exactly. you know, one problem, so back to Morocco, which is not you know Europe and the United States. Um, I know my geography. <laughs> One of the problems there uh, is that you know in there is value to women. I mean, literally value, and so they don't want anyone to know if their child has epilepsy because it will reduce their value. So some of the prescriptions they have is they have anticonvulsant sort of coded as a vitamin so that people think you're taking a vitamin so that you're not divulging you have an anticonvulsant so your value doesn't decline. Yeah, it's yeah. a whole new level of stigmatism, isn't it, in some countries? It's, yeah. So this trip to Morocco, it was really, um, it was enlightening. Yeah. Okay, so we've had another question, which is, can we say that you have learned more on the brain because of your condition? So perhaps did you focus on your research area because of an interest due to having epilepsy yourself? So initially, um, and this is gonna be a long answer. It's gonna get me no going. Problem. 
I'm not very good at remembering anything. Uh, remembering facts, I'm terrible. I said I, I failed half my high school O levels, um, but I passed the exams where the logic works. You know, so like biology, you know, it's logical, so, uh, at least sometimes. So I did like physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and then math. I could, you know, log make the logic in math so it worked for me but history geography french english oh my goodness i was terrible uh i tried what was the question again i've forgotten that already <laughs> <laughs> the question was that did you focus oh, yeah, on brain research yeah. because of your disability so exactly. i drove into neuroscience because i just found it interesting and i was able really to use gut instinct sort of feeling to ask questions as opposed to just having to remember things. So I sort of fell into neuroscience, but I certainly had interest about it. But then my initial like postdoc graduate studies were really where I could get positions that were of interest. Um, like it was really about synapses. But then as I got my own lab, now it was the opportunity. So now I really wanted to do things to learn more about epilepsy. So when I became the chair of the department, I hired uh, four or five faculty who have a focus on studying the mechanisms of epilepsy. We have a faculty member in the department who's working on a new target for and has, with a uh, biotech company, has a new small molecule for treating certain, um, it's a trans, transporter related deficit that leads to epilepsy in certain families. So the epilepsy has really guided me later in my career in terms of hiring faculty, but also how now do glial cells contribute uh, in epilepsy? And one of the fascinating things about glia, as you probably know, they're so plastic. Uh, even a small change in the environment of an astrocyte or microglia totally changed the gene expression profiles. And what does this do for function of these cells as they are working in cooperation with the neuron uh, to, to allow circuits to work? So earlier, it was less, the epilepsy was less influential. It was more, what could I do? But then as I got a footing, that's when I really, it really influenced decision-making uh, and so on. Well, I guess, yeah, you could also give your very unique own insights into the disorder. And it must have been quite a cool position to be in to actually be able to research your own disorder. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a, it's a, in a, in a weird way, you're, you're sitting in the lab, you know, you're working with a mouse brain and you're suddenly almost like you have these moments, you're feeling like you're looking into your own brain. And uh, it's like, wow. And I remember looking at um, a section of the hippocampus uh, after an animal had been, we'd induced the animals to have uh, recurrent spontaneous seizures for six months. And then we took section, we've done a lot of recordings and genetic manipulations, but then we looked at the sections and looking at the astrocytes and some of the, the, the molecules that are expressed. And that was amazing. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, what does my brain look like? <laughs> and when I was uh, ill, ill in um, 2011, where they had to change my medication to get me off the one I got the um, allergic reaction to, they wanted them to do an EEG. So I had Morty electrode cap on at nine o'clock in the morning. And the first thing they want to do is they say, get asleep. So I, I just had a night of sleep. How can I get asleep? And the poor technician didn't know I was a neuroscientist. And... Uh, I said, well, how could I get to sleep? I just slept. They said, well, just close your eyes. Okay, I'll close my eyes. Right? So then I'm allowed to open my eyes. And I'm looking at the, dis at the display of all the electrodes. And I said, okay, which electrodes are this? Oh, it's one on your head. I said, no, no, which one? And you could start to see the poor technicians like, oh my goodness, what have I got here? And then I ask, well, those four electrodes, the signal's really different than the rest of them. Are they grouped together and where? And <laughs> poor technician. And these were electrodes over my left frontal cortex, which is where wow. I had the head injury. Yeah. Mm, that's um, really cool. Yeah. But they do say that doctors make the worst patients. So <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. 
But yeah. uh, that, that I'm you're looking at your own brain's electrical activity and you've identified the traces where they're abnormal and it's the site of your head injury. Oh. And, yeah, and then I'm sitting there and in my brain, I'm getting flashbacks of these sections of the mouse brain after six months of seizures. <laughs> I can imagine. Okay, so we have another question here. What would you recommend to an early PI as to how could they best support the career of a PhD student or a postdoc if they have disclosed their epilepsy? So if a PhD student or a postdoc came to you as a PI and said, I have epilepsy, how do you think you would be able to support them in the best way? For me, what, what I would do is I would make sure that we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and talk through it. Uh, make sure that the person understands you're there to support them. Uh, and so ask, ask them, I mean, you're going to gauge how much they want to disclose. And so it's going to be a process where you, uh, you have a conversation and then you start saying, you would ask, okay, you know, if you have a seizure, what should we be doing? And get educated. And by fact that you're asking them questions, you're showing the support that they need to know that it's safe. And you know, if you know this, hopefully they will have a seizure action plan that they can give you. Uh, not necessarily true, because a lot of people don't know they should do this. Um, some neurologists are not promoting it just because they're so busy. It's more the community networks are promoting it to help. Um, so talk, ask what's needed. But at the same time, I think it's important that the individual has to still, you know, do their work. Another thing that uh, to be aware of is sleep deprivation can be a trigger for sleep seizures. And so there may need to be an accommodation, uh, you know, like I think you should be in the lab all hours of the day. But there may need, to, I know I'm, an, I'm a PI. Uh, <laughs> but you need to, that's an important accommodation to be able to make because they've got to get their sleep. And without their sleep, they're going to have a significant uh, trigger. Another major trigger for seizures is stress. Um, uh, sleep deprivation and stress stressful. are two things in academia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Perfect you know, score. where possible, um, you know, give accommodations that you can. But at the same time, you know, people have to have to do, you know, perform as well. Mm -hmm. Conversation, understand triggers and do what you can to support. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. OK, so we have one more question, which we will finish on. And that is. In your opinion, what are the most important things that the community community should be focusing on to fight the stigma on disabilities? And what, how can we make science more inclusive where anyone can contribute and excel rather than just the um, heteronormative, shall we say? Quite a broad question, I would guess. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the stigma, I think an important thing. If everyone with epilepsy were to talk about their epilepsy, stigma would be gone, right? We would understand it. People, no, people would understand it's epilepsy, da, 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 da. but because of stigma, not everyone's going to talk about it. So whatever the disorders, like here we're having this conversation, and I hope as a result, there are now going to be several people who, you know, this is epilepsy. It's fine. It's just another brain disorder. Anxiety can be absolutely debilitating for people. You know, let's talk about it. Uh, there, are, there are people who work, our brains are all different. I, I like, let me go into another aside, if I may. You know, when you look at the weather forecast on TV, they say, oh, tomorrow's temperature is, you know, it's going to be above average, right? And they say, oh, in this last month, you know, we're having this heat wave is above average. Well, average, if I trans, we're Fahrenheit, so I go and Let's say average for that day is 25 Celsius, and it was 26. I just say, come on. Almost everything is not average. And if you relate that back to people's brains, that means essentially all of us are not average. We're all different. And if we can perceive that we're all different, and it's that variety that is what makes up society that's wonderful, it needs communication for that type to occur so talk about it talk about it talk about it 
yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, so, Katerina, I think you have a question, which will be the final question. Uh, is it? Uh, I don't know if it's a question or more a comment that I would like you to to develop. So, um, regarding stigma, I think that most of disabled people uh, are ashamed, and um, well, it, it's first of all because they don't accept themselves. In my mm -hmm point of view and this is so so important um well i am diabetic uh, type 1 diabetic and i'm crossing with many diabetic people that they just don't accept the disease and they don't um do the right things to be controlled and yeah. and, so on. and it makes a total difference in their life so can you comment on that regarding epilepsy is it uh, similar uh, on that issue um, what do you recommend <laughs> yeah you know the, the i think there's a lot of people not willing to accept they have epilepsy they know they have it but not willing to accept it and almost ashamed that they have it and what did i do wrong to cause it um you know, it's a mutation in a gene for an ion channel in this particular family. It's, you did nothing wrong. So in some manner, you've got to be able, I think they then won't speak about it, but that's what my role is. And that's why I just keep talking about this. And um, Katrina, you just said it. And I bet on this webinar, 75% uh, of the people have something. And they're not talking about it. But if we understand that, that, you know, that's the norm, then there's nothing wrong with it. So me in my career position, you know, I've had a successful career. My idea is I'm going to keep talking about it. And if I can make people who hear me think, think, oh, there are a lot of people who have different types of disorders. It's okay. We need to be much more accepting of it. I think we it would help the people who have a disorder that they don't want to accept personally. I'm not certain if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, sure. Sure. we, and, we and really they, need people to speak. Yeah, visibility, visibility, visibility. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. There are some, for example, I know there are some very famous people who have epilepsy, and I can't disclose who they are. They won't talk about it. And what I have tried to do behind the scenes is show them what I'm doing and ask them, if you were to make a comment about this, it would make such a difference. Uh, and I'm not giving up. I'm going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is back again to I can and I will. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll make things happen. Let me finish with the I can and I will with a beautiful example of this from somebody in England. I'm not, uh, I was trying to message them this morning to get permission to uh, reveal their identity. So I'm not going to, because I didn't connect. But this individual is a salesperson and they started having seizures as an adult. And what happened was they would, the company didn't really make any accommodations for the individual. Well, he couldn't drive anymore and he needed to drive for his job. And he said, damn it, I'm gonna keep it going. So he'd walk 30 minutes to get to a bus stop. He'd take the bus to the train station. He'd then get the train to wherever he was going for the latest sales meeting. And that year when he had epilepsy, he was the number one salesman in the company. And that's because he said, I'm not letting it beat me. I can and I will. And I think that's a strong message that we should all think about. Definitely. Yeah. Well, on that very positive note, thank you very, very much, Phil. You are absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us today. The uh, recording will be on YouTube for people to watch at any point, or if you know anyone who might be interested, the link will be available for the imminent future. Um, our next webinar will be in September. We're taking a little hiatus over the summer because we know that a lot of people will be on holiday. And um, yeah, that just leads me to say thank you again, Phil. And um, yeah, we've really appreciated having you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, my pleasure. Okay. Thank Thanks everyone, goodbye. <laughs>